and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. The 18th of June every year is marked as International Day for Countering Hate Speech. How does this concern me, you may ask? It does concern us all, particularly in our context, where we've just concluded a general election, which again has reopened old wounds and laid bare our fault lines. Now, some people might argue that as long as there was no post-election violence, then all is well. However, scholars and think tanks think differently. The European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance says hate speech undermines the fundamental rights and values upon which democratic societies are founded and causes harm not only to individual victims, but also to society at large. Moreover, hate speech impedes pluralism and diversity by leading to polarization and negative effects on public debate and democratic life. In a piece of work done by Dr. Olushola Ishola, a senior research fellow at the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies at the University of Ibadan, he says hate speech during elections poses a challenge to peace-building efforts in the long term as reconciliation can be difficult even after elections are over. Our Electoral Act also includes detailed provisions that prohibit politically motivated hate speech. According to the Act, a political campaign or slogan shall not be tainted with abusive language directly or indirectly likely to injure religious, ethnic, tribal or sectional feelings. Now, it goes in and on, but the question is, do we pay attention at all to the sort of rhetoric and its attendant effect on our efforts at nation building? Or do we simply let it go with the wind? If we're unbothered about hate speech, could it hold any consequence for our democracy and country as time goes on? This is our focus tonight on Hard Copy. And Mr. Hilary Obuna, an international development and human rights expert and also senior advisor with the National Human Rights Commission, it's my guest. Mr. Buna, thank you for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you for having me, Mao. So let's look at this issue of hate speech. I'm looking at our context in Nigeria. Yes. Do we finally have a consensus on what constitutes hate speech? We do have a consensus on what constitutes hate speech. Um, I'm happy you, your intro was um, very excellent, and thank you for that. Um, Section 92 of the Electoral Act is very clear as to hate speech relating to elections. Then we also have Articles 19 and um, 20. In fact, it's a common article, so you find it in both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Both instruments are signed by Nigeria. We are parties to that, and a lot of their corpus, their sections, have been inf uh, have influenced Nigeria's leg legislations, mm -hmm. including the Electoral Act that you mentioned. But above all, talking about Chapter Four of the Constitution on um, against discrimination, we have a whole section devoted to the fact that nobody should be discriminated against based on all of those characterizations that the UN has actually agreed that uh, causes um, um, hate speech or upon which hate speeches are built upon. And those characterizations include issue of um, um, racial identity, ethnic identity, political and religious identity, as well as um, other related socioeconomic um, um, conditions like poverty, um, gender, and then also culture, what people hold there. So any statement you make professing hatred on someone based on this characterization is hate speech. Hmm. And this is international law and national laws that I'm telling you. And so hate speech has actually grown in terms of um, prominence and attention um, since you, you, you are aware of the, uh, of the wars in the Balkans, uh, the Bosnian War, then of course the Rwandan genocide, and now lately we are also beginning to see the effect of hate speech in the, uh, against the Rohingya Muslims in, uh, in, 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 in Myanmar. And a lot of what is happening today in Myanmar has been 
years and years of hate speeches, promotion of hate against uh, minority Muslim. And uh, before we started, we were talking about um, how does this build up, mm. you know, for, for how long does this build up? I, I, I'll come, yeah. We'll come to that shortly, yeah. but let me quickly take you up on, when I asked that question as to whether or not we have a consensus, yes, there's yeah. one thing to have a definition yes. of hate speech and be able to agree on that. The question is, when we see it, are we all agreed uh, when we see an example of it? Do we all agree that this is an example of hate speech? We don't always all agree because the purveyor of hate speech believes that he or she is exercising their human rights to free speech. Mm -hmm. And that's why even in political lexicon and even in media lexicon, you hear people tell you it's a fair comment. No, it's not a fair comment. It is hate speech. So we have seen the gradual attention being paid to fake news, because I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of hate speech constitute also fake news. Mm. So it is that convergence of these twin evils, both fake news and, um, and hate speech, that, is, uh, that are now giving us that recognition and global acceptance that um, uh, hate speech is a major violation of human rights. And based on what you read from the European Commission, hate speech is a huge impediment to pluralism, development, and sustenance of democratic society. Mm -hmm. Because when people purvey hate speeches, it impedes on electoral and political participation. It also impedes on enjoyment of human rights. It is a big discrimination on the, on the basis human dignity. And there is one right that is non-derogable in all parts of the world, and that is the right to dignity. And that is what hate speech attacks. Well, let me ask you this, because we're looking at it in this context, where right now we're post-elections, and yes. it's post uh, general elections. We're still going to have off-season elections in November, uh, but this is currently where we are. And people say that, oh, elections are like war, and that's how even outside of Nigeria they're seen now. Uh, they're, they're battles, you know, all is fair in love and war. And as long as you, you deploy strategy, yeah. it's okay. It's, you know, as long as you get your results, it should be fine at the end of the day. Why do you think that, you know, hate speech during elections could be particularly dangerous? Hate speech during elections, very, very dangerous because um, first and foremost, you attack people's identity. Elections are about expression of preference. Elections are about when people show their identity on who they want to govern them and who they want to elect. So hate speech is a direct attack on these values. And um, in the, let's, let's maintain the Nigerian context, for example. Mm. So you see a contest in Nigeria, and I like the word you use that um, elections are seen as war in Nigeria, and uh, most times wars on ethnic ground, on religious ground. Mm. People now see um, that um, uh, they deserve to be taken, they, they deserve to become president because of where they come from mm. and not really what they, what they have to offer. So in terms of that, the only way you can sustain that analogy, that line of argument is to say how far you are better than the other person. And in conveying how far you are better than the other person, you denigrate that person. You denigrate the person's religion, the person's culture, the person's ethnicity, the person's political view. You, you how rife was that in this last election? Did we, did we see a lot of that? Because some people would say, oh, we didn't really see that amongst the candidates, even though some people would have said that, or you know, there were concerns about the fact that the major candidates were from three different ethnic groups and, of course, of two different major faiths in the country. Mm. These already were very, very uh, precarious grounds that we were standing on. But then people will say, oh, the candidates largely conducted themselves well. It's their followers. And how much control do they really have over their followers? That's, that is the truth. And uh, what it does is that it takes away direct responsibility from the candidates. But you know what? If the rhetorics of the candidates inspire hate speeches, there is no way the candidates can exonerate themselves. And let me go back to what you said about how rife was all of this during the election. It was 
the elections were really charged. We've never had it discharged. And what we see is that if you play, and I, I just want you to do this, if you play most of the major campaigns by the political parties, especially these three that you mentioned, you would see that even when they make clean comments, the people that come after them, the people that come after them would not make so. There was one incident where a, a, a supporter, a major supporter and spokesperson was mimicking another candidate, an opposition candidate, and even fell on the ground trying to convulse and mimic I mean, if that is not hate speech, Malpeh, what is it? Because hate speech... He didn't speak. No, he, he didn't speak, but he used action. You could even use drawing. You know, you can speak in many ways. You can use memes, you can use um, artistic expression, you can use um, your voice, you, ca you can do, you can use objects. You can use objects. You can even bring an object that your political opponent values so much and denigrate that object. Is all and that's considered hate speech? Yes, it's considered hate speech. Because your opponent not only values that object, your opponent attaches cultural and religious significance to that. And what hate speech does is hate speech leaves the realm, and I'm talking about elections still, mm -hmm. it goes beyond, it leaves the realm of political contestation and rather focuses on individual identity. Because by attacking individual identity, you are now gaining as far as you are concerned, political traction. So for instance, it is good to say that a particular tribe in a place like Lagos uh, are, are in greats. They do not, uh, they do not um, uh, 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 appreciate um, the warm hospitality of their host. And they have always been in great that you can trace it to one millennia. You are going beyond the realm of political contestation. And then, what you have said would be repassled by political opponents, by your supporters, and the way they will react to it would then be violence. If you go to the report of the European Commission you cited, mm -hmm. they gave us like four different crescendos from the base to the top. The base being when you utter the, 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 the speech, and then the crescendo after the discrimination that will come out of the speech is violence and possibly death. And that's why the Secretary General in the last uh, brief that he, the Secretary General of the United Nations, in the last brief that he released about three weeks ago, stated that social media is a megaphone for hate speech. And secondly, hate speech threatens democratic existence and sustainable development. And what, what, what does this portend? What it means is that if you check history, and I'm not saying back to Nazi Germany, I'm just telling you history from the mid 90s till date, whether it's Cambodia, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's Bosnia, and now we are dealing with Myanmar. It all starts with categorization of certain ethnic group. It also starts with some individuals, political individuals, raising nationalism to a higher level and then bringing down a certain group that they are not equal in the realm of that nationalistic um, um, uh, uh, opinions. And I, 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 I am afraid that if care is not taken, if we do not address what his speech has done in this election, 2027 may be a child's play compared to what we saw in 2023 because people now see that it pays. It pays to, um, to denigrate uh, voters. It pays to suppress voters. It pays to become violent against voters. And this is the, this is the uh, 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 crescendo as far as Nigeria is concerned. We've not yet reached the point of killings and deaths. So, but we've reached the point of discrimination, we've reached the point of suppression, we've reached the point of um, ethnic profiling. Well, it's a very, very vivid picture that you've painted and something that is grim. I think for a number of people, they want to do something about it. You know, for some people, they think something should be done about it. Others think, you know, with time, time healeth all things. People will get with it. Uh, we've 
Survived how many elections now? There's been no problems. Oh, yes, it's politicians who just try to heat it up. After they've gotten what they want, they leave us alone and we find how to heal. Um, and this has been our experience. But do you think that there's anything other than, you know, leaving it to time that, say, the state can consciously do to, you know, foster nation building and prevent our rhetoric from getting so bad during elections? Anybody who is telling you that we would heal is just um, trying to play the ostrich. And you know what ostrich does very well. You bury your hand, head in the sand. When the wind comes, the wind blows the sand away. And we'll see your little head, Mr. Ostrich. Mm -hmm. So for head speech, um, it's again, I, I want to emphasize on the fact that the, the ultimate impact, and when I say ultimate impact, I mean the level of violence we saw in those countries I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the ultimate impact may not be seen today. And that's where it gets really bad mm -hmm. because it piles up. It builds up, it piles up, and it's pressed down. So by when it becomes volcanic, when it erupts, you know, you, you will be asking, is it this little thing? But you don't know when it dates back to. And I think I, uh, I want to reply the, the last um, comment you made about what do we do? Post-election violence. I mean, our leaders need to understand that um, our country is heavily divided. And um, when I say our leaders, I'm not talking about um, the president of the country alone. Um, in fact, the governors even have as much work to do as the president. And uh, uh, the president I have seen is going around. And I really hope he also ventures into um, opposition territories. I mean, he has been with traditional rulers in, uh, in the Southwest. Um, hopefully, when there is time, he needs to also go um, put hands, shake hands across uh, various geographies in the country. Um, he needs to be the number, he needs to be the bam that heals Nigeria. Well, you know, some people will say hate speech is now a problem for yes. democracies all over the world. We saw what happened in the United States. Um, Brazil. Brazil uh, was still saying the effect of it, in, in, you know, in many other democracies. So the question right now is how do we heal um, or how do how do we tame hate speech without affecting a core tenet of a democratic of democratic free speech how, how do we do that now of course that has always been a major a major point of reference um, hate speech versus free speech but we know really what free speech is not in fact even the first amendment the so-called United States First Amendment, mm -hmm. you know, the, the bastion of, of press freedom, it's, it has it there inserted that this press freedom does not mean that you should go um, insulting people or um, denigrating people. You do that, you are also infringing on human rights. Mm -hmm. So based on the spirit of the First Amendment and the spirit of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which also is clear as to what free speech is not. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is clear as to what free speech is not. So we know what free speech is not. Free speech does not include, for instance, you um, giving labels to tribes in order to secure political vote. You know, that is what Section 92 that you cited, you know, uh, 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 provides for. Rather, what I also think we should be focusing now is accountability. You know, and that comes to your point about how do we move forward? Mm -hmm. We cannot move forward without accountability. There are certain people for the roles they played in undermining human dignity, democratic values, and human rights in this 2023 election should be brought to justice. Mm. And, and we know them. We know what they did. We know the roles they played, from Lagos to Enugu to Kano to Sokoto, Cross River. We know the roles all of these people play. They are well documented. And, and, and they, they went beyond the call of politics. Mm. I'm afraid that the day would come when we will look back and we would regret that we didn't act. The National Human Rights Commission did make an attempt. I mean, we heard them say that they were going to
prosecute a few people, you know, over comments that they made during the elections. We haven't quite seen any move since they said that. Um, uh, but I am just wondering, first, do you think that the National Human Rights Commission is the best suited agency for that? And do you, do you also imagine that they have sufficient political will to be able to do it? Now, um, the National Human Rights Commission cannot prosecute. The National Human Rights Commission um, in September last year established an online hate speech register, national hate speech register. And through its offices in all the 36 states and FCT, um, have been collating and investigating hate speeches from all medium and platform. So what we have done so far is analyze all of this now that the elections seem to have come to an end. Uh, we are analyzing all of this. And uh, what we would do is invite, invite whoever we have indicted and we will give them fair hearing. Uh, there are a lot of them politically exposed persons, um, traditional and religious leaders. And when we are done with the investigation, we would forward the names, the case files, to the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation and of the state. That's what our act says. The Enabling Act of the National Human Rights Commission says that where there are human rights violations that constitute criminal acts, the Human Rights Commission has the power to refer such investigations to the Attorney General of the Federation and of the state. So some of the hate speech had national impact. Those ones will go to the Attorney General of the Federation. The ones that have state-restricted impact would see it, that it goes to the Attorney General of the state. What they finally do with it, Mao eh, um, is not within our powers. Social yeah. media, yeah. as you've said, is a megaphone for yeah. this. Yeah. But beyond uh, with punitive measures, you know, which could which will be indicting, et cetera. Um, what other reconciliatory moves do you think that governments can make? And, you know, what body of government will be statutorily responsible, saddled with that responsibility? There are various levels, and I want to start with the highest level. I've already talked about the president. Mm -hmm. The president is the father of the nation. Uh, he, is, he has the biggest convening platform. Mm -hmm. I would think that within his 100 days in office, the president should set up probably um, a high-level reconciliation panel. Will it work when matters are still in court? Yes, because by the first, by the first um, 100 days in office, even though the matters are still in court, the president can actually start, I'm not saying he should reach out to the opposition, mm -hmm. okay? He should reach out to other non-state actors, even within his own party, even in the president's party, you know, people are not happy. That's on one level. Then the second level is with the National Peace Commission, National Peace Committee. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see a National Peace Committee, and I have very great respect for the members of that committee. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see them only show up during elections. Okay, they played a very key role elections after elections now. We want them to be seen more, even in terms of reconciliation, play that role, use their convening power. Then, of course, there is the National Orientation Agency. You know, we think the National Orientation Agency should play more active role in sensitizing Nigeria about our unity, our values, and also those things that bind us together rather than those things that divide us. Whatever divides us uh, 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 sh should be seen in the eyes of politicians alone who wants to win elections. But in the eyes of the citizen, the ordinary citizen of Nigeria, you know, we have more that binds us than divide us. But unfortunately, our politicians would always come up with divisive tendencies. Oh, Mr. Hilary Obunna, thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you, Mao Ben. Thank you. I really enjoyed my time. Well, that's the program tonight. Your feedback is welcome to the handle showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Mao Ben Yusuf. Good night. Mm -hmm.